The stakes are high now, right? The stakes have definitely changed. And I think that video really sets the tone for the conference over the next two days around flawless application delivery. I want to reiterate a couple of the statements that were made in that video, because for me, they really resonated. The first is that your applications are no longer just an extension of the business or the company that you work for now. In fact, they are a personification of that business. They are how people perceive your company to be. You know, we could have picked on many different companies. The reality is that sites are going down almost daily. And for a number of reasons, it could be poor planning, poor design, a sudden influx of traffic that was unexpected, uh, just general infrastructure problems that can go wrong. But the reality is that sites do go down every day. And, and we could have picked any one of these. I want to share an experience with you of something more personal for me. You may tell from my accent I'm not from Texas. Uh, I'm originally from Australia. And in Australia, once, a year, one, sorry, once every five years, we hold a national survey. It's called the census. And the census gathers data from the residents around the type of dwellings they live in, the number of residents, uh, age, gender, even some optional questions around religion. Right? And they gather this on a single day and night in a five-year period. And Australia is a population of just under 25 million people. And it was actually conducted last month in August. And it started off very nicely with the Prime Minister of the country sending out a nice tweet that he and his family had completed the survey online. Within a few hours, the website was down. Right? Not was it down, but it was down over a 43-hour period. Just think about that, a 43-hour period. And guess what happened? The blame game started, right? The prime minister of the country is talking about a, that the reason was a potential malicious DDoS attack. Then information also came out that, in fact, it wasn't a DDoS attack. It was anomalous traffic, unexpected traffic coming into the site, even after public data showed that there were several hundreds of thousands of dollars spent load testing this particular site. Now, you would have thought that when you run a, 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 a survey for 25 million people, you could probably anticipate the amount of traffic coming in, particularly when it has to be done in a single day. So this heavily impacted the department that was responsible, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, within the Australian government. And, it, and the, the census is done both online, but for those that don't want to do online, it's also delivered in a physical package. So collectors come and collect these packages. And not only did they get negative responses, they actually, some of them got death threats because people were so frustrated that because this is compulsory to complete and that the government didn't organize it correctly, they had to complete the physical documents rather than go online. So this absolutely had a perception issue for the Australian Bureau of Statistics, but it even went further than that. It even got to the point where the Australian press were questioning the validity and credibility of the Prime Minister to run the country if he can't run a website. These are the stakes for today's world, right? These are the stakes that we live at. And let me tell you, there's no mercy. Consumers have no mercy and the press have no mercy. In an instant, as soon as your site is down, your customers are complaining online on social media or on Twitter and the press are publishing articles about your site being down. And now that has, a, as I said, it reflects the credibility of your company. And inevitably, these things happen on the day when you least want them to happen, right? The day that you're launching the census, the day that you're launching healthcare.gov, the day that you're launching the most popular finale of your TV series for the season, right? The day that you're launching your biggest sale of the year for Thanksgiving, uh, for Black Friday or Cyber Monday. Inevitably, it's on the day when you should be driving the most revenue, you're attracting the most customers, and that your company is most visible is when something goes wrong, and your best day quickly becomes your worst. That's the tone of the video. Those are the stakes, and that's why you're here at this conference talking about flawless application delivery. So I want to start now by thanking you and welcoming you to the conference now that we've spoken a little bit about the video and I think set the stakes for why we're all here. And I want to ask that uh, you just look around the room and see who's here in the room, right? These are 
people in our community that are supporting the Nginx project and community globally. We chose Austin as the city for the event for a couple of reasons. It's our third uh, annual event. The last two have been in San Francisco. We wanted to pick somewhere that was more neutral for East and West Coast. For me, Austin holds a special uh, place in my heart. When I first moved to the US, I moved to Virginia. I lasted one winter. <coughs> and I decided that wasn't for me. So I looked for somewhere south, somewhere a little warmer. And it came down to two cities, Austin and Miami. Eventually, Miami won out uh, partly because of the beach, but also because I had more direct flights to the places I was traveling to for my work at the time. But Austin was definitely uh, the number two city on my list. I've had so many great experiences here, I can't tell you. You know, quite often when I go to restaurants, uh, I'm standing in line and I'll ask for a table and someone will hear my accent and say, where are you from? Why don't you sit with us for dinner? This is random strangers standing in line inviting me to join them for dinner. So the hospitality in this town is fantastic. Um, in some cases, it was too hospitable. Uh, I missed a flight. The only time in my entire life I've ever missed a flight was uh, in Austin. I do have one recommendation for a bar. My favorite bar is called Pete's Dueling Piano Bar. Uh, those guys are amazing. Uh, they'll play any song for tips, and they'll usually include something that's going on in the audience in the song. So if you do want a recommendation, I, I suggest Pete's Dueling Piano Bar. So please enjoy uh, the event here in Texas and in Austin. I want to share some statistics with you, and you may have seen some of these on the screen. We now have over 180 million websites and domains running Nginx technology around the world. And just to give you a sense of how quickly this has grown, when Igor, Maxim, and Andrew first started this company in 2011, because Igor, for the previous seven years, had been running the project single-handedly on his own, uh, we were at 32 million websites. We have now added almost 150 million domains in the last five years since Igor, Andrew, and Maxim started Nginx Inc. That's an incredible advancement. Number two is we now have over 50% of the busiest sites in the world using the software. So I think it's fair to say that we've become the standard for anyone running an application at web scale. And the third statistic that I put on the screen here I think is even more important, that there's only 100 staff, and, and for us at Nginx Inc., that's quite a milestone, right? We, you know, we now have 100 people in the company. But the reality is, it wasn't 100 people that got 180 million websites and domain names. It is this army that we talk about, this army of people. It's the people in this room. It's the companies that you work at. It's the developers, the millions of developers around the world that use our technology. It's the ecosystem and partners that build technology on top and around of Nginx. It's the press and analysts that support our technology and, 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 and help customers understand where it can help them save money and improve efficiencies. Gartner, by the way, last week announced that Nginx was the first open source company to be included in their application delivery controller, Magic Quadrant, which I think is an amazing step forward for open source and for Nginx. So we thank the analysts and the press, in addition, as I said, to all of the community of people here in the room. And you are the army that support each other. So we've set, I think, the, the stakes, right? We know the stakes are big. If it can question a prime minister and a president, it can definitely question your CEO and potentially other people in the company's uh, credibility. But the world is changing, and, and I think we all know that, but I believe the world's changing actually quicker than we all anticipated. Hence, the world is spinning a little faster. Let's talk about some of the facts, right? Let's talk about e-commerce. So, E-commerce in the last 10 years has grown threefold, so 3x growth in a 10-year period. So gone are the days back in the early 2000s when we were scared to put a credit card online, we were scared to make a purchase because we didn't know if we could return it if it wasn't the right size. Those fears are gone, right? And that's already changed the way that we're thinking and acting as a society. The reality is, though, that that only is 10% of all overall purchases are done online. So analysts are saying that this is going to grow at a compound rate of 20% or more year on year moving forward. So imagine what our world looks like today when it's only 10% of online spending. Imagine when that changes to 20% or 30% or 50%. How our expectations are going to change around the performance of application application delivery. Because the reality are that today, already 60% 
of research to purchase a product is done online, even if only 10% is actually transacted. And 57% is before they even contact the vendor involved. So if you lose a customer, you don't even know you've lost them, because 57% of the time, they've made the decision about their purchase before even involving a vendor or supplier. So the stakes are getting higher even still. And it's getting easy, even easier to purchase online. I don't know if you remember several years ago when you used to purchase, it would take several minutes to go through all the process of entering, entering the credit card and, and so forth. Now they've got it down to 17 seconds with fingerprint ID on your phone, single click buy buttons. That is an incredible experience. Let me tell you an alternative experience. Last week, my family and I were at JCPenney and we were buying some, some clothes for our child. We stood in line for 15 minutes behind seven people and the line didn't move because the first person in the line was wanting to do a return, get a credit, the cashier wasn't quite sure how to do it in the, in the, in the terminal, just to buy a few items. 15 minutes of standing in line versus 17 seconds, I'll take 17 seconds every day of the week. So let's talk a little bit about the size of the opportunity. So it's total business to consumer spending by 2020 will be 3.2 billion, sorry, 3.2 trillion dollars. That sounds like a lot of money, right? And I think people in this room are saying that's very good, Gus, but we're not a business to consumer company, we're a business to business company. Let me tell you that the stakes are even higher still. Business to business will be 6.7 trillion. 6.7, more than double business to consumer, right? And the realities are that the way that we do B2C is impacting the business behavior of what we expect for B2B. Not is it only changing behavior, it's changing expectations, right? How many times have you gone to the airport and had your boarding pass on your phone and you're trying to bring it up as you're standing in front of the security officer to try and get it and you're holding everyone up in the line, right? You get frustrated when technology doesn't work for you. We believe and expect this stuff to just work, right? When you're on an airplane flying at 1,000 kilometers an hour at 30,000 feet and you're upset that your Wi-Fi gets disconnected, <laughs> right? Louis C.K. has done a great bit on this. If you, I wanted to do the whole bit, but I'm not as good as a comedian, but look it up on YouTube, it's hysterical. Our expectations have changed. We expect to be able to buy our office supplies online. We expect to be able to do our finances online and have the same experience. We expect to be able to list our house and sell our house and have the same experience as we do as buying something on Amazon or ordering an Uber or renting a house through Airbnb or a room. Our expectations have changed. So digital business is here and, and, and so many analysts and people talk about digital business, digital economy, digital transformation. It's not just e-commerce. Digital business is more than just e-commerce. It's the convergence of the physical and digital worlds, right? So yes, it includes online transactions and the consumer experience with delivering applications, but also includes machine to machine. So we're in a world now where supply parts for building an airplane have digital sensors in them that tell the supply chain that they're delayed in transit and to look for alternative parts to build the plane so the whole production isn't slowed down. This is the world we're living in, and applications are becoming a critical cornerstone of how we as companies operate, whether it's the front-end consumer-facing retail or, or application uh, user interface, or the back-end machine-to-machine, all of that is critical, and if any part of that goes down, the business goes down. So the stakes are high. And you want the proof? The proof that technology is leading the charge here? In July of this year, for the first time in history, the five largest companies by market capitalization were technology companies. So we've talked about the stakes. Let me talk a little bit about moving into how applications are actually built. And many people, when they think about apps, they think about an icon on their phone. You know, I, I, we all know that's different, right? An application is more than just an icon. It's a, it's a new digital marketplace. Right? It's the way that we bring buyers and sellers together. It could be a heterogeneous marketplace like an Amazon, or it could be a homogeneous like your particular company and your products and services. But at the end of the day, we're bringing buyers and sellers together in a digital marketplace. And what we're finding in this, in this evolution as the marketplace moves from bazaars to shopping malls to applications is that you can unlock additional suppliers and, and buyers. 
Just look at how Uber and Airbnb have brought additional suppliers to the market with private cars and private houses. The opportunities for us to open and expand our marketplace through applications is absolutely possible. But let me tell you, it's not just the startups and the disruptors that are seeing this evolution and this change. Traditional enterprise absolutely see this change, and they're making the necessary adjustments. If you look at companies like Nordstrom, Nordstrom in Q1 of this year did 21% of all their revenue online. Macy's, just last month, said they're going to close down 100 stores and, and move that investment to their online retail business. And as I've said before, you can see these changes coming in every enterprise you're working with. So there's no doubt in my mind that enterprises and, and traditional companies recognize this change. You know, for me, we've talked about, uh, how many of you were here last year at the event? Okay, just a few. So last year, hey, Dragos. A few of you last year that were here will remember I talked about Heal. Heal was an application uh, that gave real peace of mind to my family. We had just flown into San Francisco two or three weeks before the conference, and once we landed, my daughter had a, had an, a, a fever, and my wife was so upset, so we were trying to get a pediatrician. We couldn't get one, and someone recommended this app, and eventually we had a pediatrician within 60 minutes to our apartment, and we knew that, that Chloe was fine. So, you know, a year ago, this was the type of app that gave us peace of mind. What's giving my wife and I peace of mind now, particularly we're at dinner, is a new app. Uh, Disney Junior, who, she can digitally stream her favorite shows. She's two, by the way. She uses the iPad better than I do. And she can watch uh, Disney Junior, so my wife and I can actually eat dinner if we're out. The problem is that I still uh, wake up at four o'clock in the morning when I'm traveling with the theme song playing in my head. And if you're a parent, I'm sure you know what, that, what that's like. If it's not Sophia, it's the Wiggles. They're Australian, so I have to support them a little bit. Uh, but enterprises are definitely changing, and they recognize this. And, and CIO Magazine recognized 100 innovators in this space. DirecTV is, is, is one of these innovators. There were many on this list, but DirecTV was one of them. And DirecTV had this fantastic quote that I want to call out here. Not only were they using lightweight tools like Nginx and Node.js, but the reasoning and the benefits they got from making the architectural shift were exactly what you'd expect. Increased revenue, better quality of product, and a better experience for the customer, and improved competitive advantage with speed to market. No better reason to do anything in business, right? Oh, I want to increase revenue. I want to be more competitive. Right? I want to give a better experience to my customers. Makes a lot of sense, right? And so this is happening, but the question is, how fast? Because enterprises are traditionally larger organizations with existing uh, cultures, existing tools, existing applications, and making the shift is not necessarily as easy as you would think. Now, we've spent the last five years as a company working with companies to help expedite this process. So I want to share with you some of the learnings that we've had along the way, because I think this might be helpful. So what have we learned at, uh, at Nginx through this process? Number one, it's all about the app. Don't lose sight of the fact, because it's very easy to get caught up in, well, there's all these cool new tools and infrastructure, and, and do I want to do containers or virtual machines or data center or cloud? At the end of the day, the changes you're making are to provide a better customer experience which is delivered through your application. And it's really about agile software development practices, it's about continuous integration and delivery, and about providing that better customer experience. Don't lose sight of the, of the fact that the core reason that we're making these changes is to deliver a better application experience, not because we want cooler infrastructure underneath the application. The second thing is that many people think, okay, I've, I, I've decided I'm doing agile, I'm doing continuous integration delivery, it's all about the tools. No. The, often the biggest cultural uh, issue that you'll face, is, sorry, the largest issue you'll face is changing culture. Is how do, I, how do I restructure my team? How do I put the right processes in place across these new teams? How do I get real accountability into these teams so that they are focused around the SLA and the customer experience? That cultural shift can take six to 12 months. 
Many of the customers in this room know what I'm talking about. You've been through this experience. You know that this is often the largest hurdle. So don't lose sight of the cultural issues and how do you do cultural change management as part of your process. Because we're a thought leader in the world of microservices, people often think we think every problem is solved with microservices. It's, not, it's definitely not the truth. The reality is that quite often a monolith is a better architectural approach. If you've got a, a very defined application feature set, uh, if you've got a centralized team that, uh, that can build that feature set, then actually going with a monolith is going to be a, a much faster development process and, lo and, and less complex to manage as you deploy. So there's the right circumstances for a monolith. For a microservice architecture, if you're, going, if you're entering an application where you think the feature set is going to evolve over, the time, over time and you think is, is somewhat undefined, then maybe microservices is a better path. If you've got decentralized and fragmented development teams, then microservices may be a better path. If you see this, web, this application going at large scale across the web, then microservices may be a better path. But I do want to say that from a, you know, an Nginx perspective, both architectures make sense for different horses for different courses, right? We often get asked by our customers, should we go to the cloud, friend or foe, right? You know, I, I've, from my perspective, you know, cloud has brought so much advantages to de software development. To quickly you know, grab an instance on the cloud and start developing an application, to bypass sometimes internal IT and just get something up and running, it can be much faster and efficient. And to have compute resource you know, on demand is incredibly you know, advantageous when you want to scale up an application. But there are some cons as well, right? When, when, before cloud was called cloud, does anybody remember what it was called? Some people called it on demand, others called it utility computing, right? We were talk, people were talking about utility computing like it would be a power socket, like I could get compute power out of the wall like I do electricity. That was the promise 10 years ago. And I think we're kind of there, right? We can get compute power from a number of different cloud providers. The reality is, though, that cloud providers are starting to look a little bit more like this, where you've got the, I'm glad you got the joke there, the compute power, but there are all these additional services and APIs that you can connect into that actually mean that if you ever want to move your application from cloud to cloud or hybrid or back to your own data center, it makes it very difficult. I've been in the industry, and I hate to say it, but since the late 80s, and if we go back, and think about what we've tried to achieve as, a, as an industry, we've actually tried to achieve application abstraction from underlying infrastructure. From back in the days of the mainframe, that you could only run mainframe apps on a mainframe, or the days of Unix systems, where you could only run a Sun app on Solaris and a Sun system. Then we moved to sort of the Microsoft and Linux world, where, OK, we had choices of hardware underneath. And now we're moving to cloud. and the risk is that we go back to a point of where we lock in our applications to the underlying infrastructure. So the recommendation I'd say here is cloud is good, but there are some concerns or risks that you may want to address. And one of them is make sure you choose the right tools that give you that abstraction from the underlying infrastructure, that give you the option of portability in the future. And then finally, the right tools. And, and without a doubt, you want to select the right tools because that's what attracts the right talent. You can't bring in developers straight out of college and tell them to start working on, on WebSphere or WebLogic, let's say, right? People want to bring the tools that they know how to use and they, and they, they feel uh, they can work on and provide the best application outcome for you. Typically, these tools are lightweight, they're open source, and they're developer friendly. Now, some of the pictures, if you can see on the laptop there, are, are some examples, right? Obviously, we had to put Nginx on there, but Jenkins, uh, you know, Docker and containers, Node, uh, MongoDB. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. There's many different lightweight tools. But typically, they're open source, lightweight, and very developer friendly. And this will help your companies attract the right talent to, de to develop the type of applications that you want to build. So what are we doing at Nginx? We kind of talked about the stakes. The stakes are high. We talked about the world is changing and how can we expedite our existing companies and our, and our application development processes to take advantage of these changes. And what is actually Nginx as a company doing here to help? We're going to hear more from Owen after me and Igor on this specifically, but we're continually investing in our products. We release Nginx open source monthly. 
And just so for those of you in the room that aren't aware, Nginx Open Source is, is managed and deployed and, and released by Nginx the company, us. And we deliver that every month with the help of the community, of course. Uh, in addition to that, we release Nginx Plus three to four times a year. We're also investing in new products like Amplify to give you more visualization and monitoring capability of your application architectures. We're also integrating other open source projects with Nginx like Mod Security. So many people have asked us for Mod Security and WAF included in Nginx. So we've done that work and worked with the team at Mod Security to make that happen natively on Nginx, not with a shim with Apache around it, but actually natively built on Nginx. So we continually invest in our products, and you'll hear Igor talk about some advanced work we're doing around an application process manager as well. We, have, we invest in our engineering talent, and, and I, I, I feel so proud to be able to say that I believe we've got the best engineering talent around Nginx on the planet by far. And I think that that's, that's comes through for you as customers when you engage with our support team. And I hope that many of you in this room can attest to the quality and value from our support. Our engineers uh, you know, and support team just work tirelessly, and, and the support that we give, you know, typically is, most issues are resolved 60 to 70% through first-line support, because our quality of support is, is phenomenal, I believe, and I hope you, you can all attest to that. So we continue to invest in our engineering talent, um, which we've recently launched uh, a number of microservice reference architectures, because many customers were asking us, hey, we want to go down this microservices path, but we don't want to make the same mistake as everyone else has made. How do we circumvent that? So we created three different models for three different use cases around how to deploy a microservice architecture. So you can focus on the code and not all the underlying connective bits. And so Chris Stetson, who uh, wrote this for us, is presenting on this uh, on Thursday afternoon, so I encourage you, if you have the time, to go to his presentation and hear more about the, the microservices reference architectures. And we're delivering more around training, so more advanced training, advanced training on how to use Nginx, Nginx in very specific use cases, and once again, Nginx in a microservice architecture. And we're actually holding our first public training of the microservices course here on Friday, and I know a number of you in the room are attending that. So in conclusion, I just wanted to, to reiterate the fact that I'm so thankful. You know, I've been with the company now, just coming up to now four years. So thankful for all of you in the room here as community members, as customers, as personal analysts, because together you create this army that moves this project forward. As I said, we're, we're at 180 million websites and growing, and uh, it wouldn't be possible without you. And we're here as well to support you with all the things that we're doing as a company. And if there's anything that I can do or the team can do to make this next two days a better experience for you, please let us know. We all have Nginx t-shirts on, so you should be able to find us. And I'd like to ask you to uh, join me in welcoming Igor Sisoev to the stage. Igor is the original author of Nginx. Uh, he's coming up to talk to you a little bit about containers, microservices, and some of the future things that he sees happening in application delivery. So please join me in welcoming Igor. Thank you. Thank you for coming to our third annual conference and for supporting Nginx. It's very satisfying to me to see the continued adoption of both Nginx and Nginx Plus. Last year I spoke about Engine Script project that we were starting. Uh, the goal is to extend Nginx configurations with logic written in JavaScript. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we made a major preview release, and today our uh, professional service engineer, Konstantin Palov, will talk about um, TCP and, and UDP balancers, and he will show example how to use Nginx script with the balancer. The project is still in progress, and I'm currently extending uh, JavaScript implementations to include more and more language, language features. <clears throat> but uh, beside Nginx, uh, beside uh, JavaScript, we, we are looking at challenges created by some uh, modern ways of running applications. I believe that Docker and containers popularity was caused not so much by isolations of running application processes as by isolation of 
uh, application files, data, and by the ways of applications provisioning. Uh, Linux containers uh, are much more independent from uh, the rest of the system than usual Linux packages. And this allows administrator, administrators and developers uh, to be worried less about uh, uh, libraries and frameworks compatibility. And, <clears throat> and, uh, I, uh, and continuous approach leads naturally to a concept of microservices in a cloud. Uh, uh, this is for the evolution of uh, idea of isolations when a monolithic application is split into independent functional parts. Uh, <clears throat> the microservices have a lot of advantages, such as uh, flexibility of uh, development and deployment, uh, ability to run in a cloud, uh, scalability, split testings, and other. However, unfortunately, uh, microservices introduce also some disadvantages, such as incre increase of the uh, number of moving parts uh, and uh, communications overhead between the microservices. To address these issues, we, are, we have started experimental work uh, which should fix these shortcomings. Uh, by embedding uh, some Nginx features inside applications with our application manager. Some of these features do not require changes to applications at all. Uh, for example, uh, accelerated content delivery. Uh, as, with, uh, as with usual Nginx uh, usage, uh, a special delivery thread uh, sends application, uh, set uh, data generated by applications to a client. And all that you need uh, to do is just to run your applications with our manager. It's drop-in replacement and doesn't require any changes. However, other features require some adoption, uh, application adoption. For example, <coughs> Uh, application can instruct manager to send a large file by send file operation. Uh, it's so-called send file offload. Uh, and, uh, or uh, the application can say uh, the manager to, to process a request for static files by the manager itself without any uh, application participation. Yet another feature, uh, for example, uh, application can instruct manager to cache some responses in the similar way as Nginx does. It looks very similar if you work with Nginx before. Uh, another feature is mm, upstream connectors. Uh, the connectors support, uh, support uh, fault tolerance and uh, upstream balancing and application will just uh, offload all this complexity to the connectors. Uh, it just calls connectors in the same way uh, as uh, it sends request to Nginx balancer. And of course, uh, our manager will, uh, will, will be able to run a lot of uh, several application processes and can handle the abnormal quits, hangs, and other failures. The configuration of the manager will be dynamic uh, by remote API or, and by application. There, there will be no any uh, static uh, configuration. And one of my favorite feature in Nginx is online binary upgrade without service interruption. However, uh, uh, this feature allows you to uh, upgrade old Nginx version to a new one without um, service interruption. However, uh, if we speak about uh, containers, they are usually shut down it and then run again with new version of applications. 
and uh, there is some uh, interruption in the service. Uh, we, we will uh, fix this issue by passing leasing uh, sockets from one container to another one, and this allows to upgrade your applications without any service uh, interruptions, uh, and everything will be seamlessly. Uh, as today, we uh, have made preliminary PHP support, prototype of PHP support, and currently we're working on Python, Python support, Java, JavaScript, and Ruby in a pipeline. Thank you again for coming here, and I hope you will enjoy the content we will prepare for you over the next two days. Thank you.